Hey all, welcome to Circle of Tone. Today we have the mighty Venom. Can't really recreate this one. Sounds like it was recorded underground, then reverb added, and uh, so we all know the story, but let's get straight to it. Circle of Tone, Venom. Lay down your soul to the gods, rock and roll! back happy hexmas everyone and this time it was the mighty mantis and chronos because between the two of them they get like a horrific sound that pretty much kicked off the black metal era it is when people hear venom they often get surprised like this isn't dank enough or whatever but you have to put yourself there you have to be an old bastard like me to realize the impact that they had when it came to the scary aspect of music they were one of the first bands that actually embraced Satan. They weren't Satanists, but they actually did it to shock, and they kind of uh, pushed it. And ironically, by the third album, they called it At War With Satan, and that's the one that got banned. So when it's like they're fighting Satan, they get banned. So that's pretty funny. <laughs> so let's talk about the gear. With Kronos, the bass player, he actually, people thought that he used an Araya bass on these, but he actually used a Gibson. He used the Gibson SG style, I think it's the EB3. And it was the bass guitar that was owned by the bass player Free. So that's pretty, pretty sweet. And he actually smashed that up on stage and then he moved to the AB. But for that first album, for the first uh, Venom album, it was the Gibson EB bass. He also used a Big Muff pedal as well to drive it. So the big mo and I actually have that set up. I have the same setup. I used a uh, a Glary bass on this. Uh, they're only about seventy bucks uh, to to buy, and there's a link in description. They're amazing basses. I was going to use a jazz because he used a jazz in the past, but I tried to put a new pickup in it, and my pickup wouldn't fit. So it was a Gibson bass, and the because he, he laughed, he said because he, he was a guitarist, that's why he ended up going through the guitar stack. And he was actually showing a bass player, a potential bass player, the riffs on the bass, and he was like, I I kind of like this. And he gave himself a challenge. He told himself of learning a pretty technical um, Rush song and sing it at the same time. And once he did that, he was confident enough to start playing live. So, on to the guitars. Mantas, what did he use? Funny enough, he used an old... Everything was a copy. He had a, a copy of a Flying V, Gibson Flying V copy. He had a Gibson uh, uh, LP copy, Les Paul. And he also had a uh, Strat copy. <laughs> so all of the copies... 
and uh, I used an Electra copy of a uh, Les Paul. It's not going to sound the same because he also used oddball speakers. He used a JCM 800 head and he used a uh, blue fuzz pedal that he hated, but he said like it was everything on 11 and out of control. So I went through the uh, the, the Schmogus board of what was a big blue fuzz pedal back then, and I could not match it with the styles of fuzzes I have. I have a, I tried everything. Is it back here? No, I got, you know, the blue fuzz face, things like that. And I think if it was a fuzz face, that's such a memorable pe pedal name. He probably would have remembered that if it was a fuzz face. And there was a lot of fuzzes kicking around back then. So what could it be? What could it be? Do you know? If you know the, this mystery blue fuzz, because I've been on a mission trying to find it, what was banging around? What what pedal makers were there? You know, because some people, some of these fuzzes are actually regional, you know, because you can only get some in America. You can only get some in Birmingham. You can only get some in London, you know, things like that. So if you know, that would be great, because uh, that was the key to his terrible sound of his first two albums, which is glorious and terrifying. <laughs> the mystery speaker and with the speakers uh, I always say on this channel the most important aspect when you're trying to match tones is the speaker so on the second album on uh, black metal I believe that was the Ibanez destroyer there was the same gear on black metal uh, but they added the uh, Ibanez Explorer style destroyer but what, what's interesting with this is the that one album Kronos actually talked the studio into doing more bands and they became neat records and neat to legendary they did uh raven uh tigers of pantang you know all bands like that with new wave of british heavy metal so chronos practically didn't just start black metal he also helped start you know the new wave of british heavy metal so he has a big hand in it you know uh it's fair play fair play to to uh to chronos he knew what was up and it's it's such a shame that him and mantis just uh it's ever it the bridge is burned it's just glorious of how outrageous they were back in the day. <laughs> he, he was working, Kronos, imagine working with Kronos as like a T-boy in the studio. He was working in the studio, right? And this studio only did stand-up comedians and they also did uh, folk music. So they didn't do any rock bands. So he convinced them, he nagged them and nagged them. Can I get some, he got the engineer to do it for free. He blagged his way in and said, can you do start doing a rock band? So they did the rock band. And I think that is key to why it sounded so bad or slash great. Because when you traditionally do folk, you, you're not exactly miking up mandolins and everybody. It's usually a couple of overheads and getting the actual uh, stereo spread of what you're hearing. So it's almost like you're standing in the room, much like an orchestra. You're not going to be, you know, miking up everything. So I have a feeling that that album was miked up uh, straight, like as if they were trying to mic up a folk band. And that is why it sounds so like hellish. And there's also rumor that the bass speakers were blown as well. It's why you can't really hear the bass that much when the guitars are going. And it's almost like it's so huge and flappy on the low end, but then it's like disappears. So yeah, but that's it. Cause that's the, the way the bass sounds on that along with the guitars, which I think are out of phase. So you have phase issues, which it's phase, when, when you get an issue with phase with guitars, what it sounds like is if it's going through a big toilet tube and it's got this whistling type of claustrophobic crappy sound and I think I actually tried to recreate it by causing phase to see if I could get the right so it's hard enough to like move a mic around mic around and get the right spot on a specific speaker that they used but then when you're talking about phase you got all this other shit that could be so chaotic and that is what I keep on talking about is the chaos aspect for it to be rock and roll, for it to be, you know, gritty and the rest of it. But it's that chaos that people crave. And it was actually the new wave of black metal that was started because of how polished Morris Sound Studio and everything was getting when it comes to the death metal. With the drum replacement and the, you know, started to creep in with the gating, dr gated drums and uh, samples being, you know, for snares and things like that. That is when bands like Mayhem propped up because it was almost like anti-music. So the black metal thing where people say, oh, this isn't grim enough when they listen to the old stuff. It was the, it was more of the attitude and the fucking come on aspect of it is the boom, you know, no pretense. There was, pre, you know, there's obviously the Kiss references and the, 
you know, the, there was actually a lot of punk influence in there as well, where they wanted to out punk the punks. They wanted to scare everybody, including the punks. So it's all these, it's the attitude that people respect the most when it comes to Venom. And Venom used to spread their own rumors that they didn't play their instruments or that they were classically trained or that they had other people filling in. You know, was, they, they, they used to give all these contradicting rumors of, of their capabilities and everything. Pretty funny. They knew how to uh, how to make an impact, put it that way. <laughs> the bulldozer bass was born, you know, playing the bass through a guitar amp. And uh, I keep on saying it, it's the best way to do it. Just don't put everything on 11 like him, otherwise you will fuck up speakers. Even G12T, Dash 75s, which I believe he used. <laughs> on Amazon, check out the Live at London Venom. It's free if you have Amazon Prime. And so that's some good quality footage and good audio. So it's really good to see them in their prime. And it is insane. The best, one of the craziest bass solos I've ever seen is talking about uh, over the top. <laughs> it's great. And with the first album, with him being able to cut demos in Neat Rec, what became Neat Records. He approached the record, lab, the record label with their first demos that they did there. And the record label were like, no, this is crap. Go and do it again. I'll give you three days and do another demo. So they did, they did another demo in three days. They brought it back to the record company and they said, look, we're just going to release this. And Kronos was like, no, it's crap. But he's like, no, we're going to release this. This or nothing. And that was Welcome to Hell. <laughs> so it's basically a demo that they released. But what did it start? It started an avalanche of crap afterwards because the now black metal is so... It ruined the underground. Black metal is everywhere. Black and thrash, black and roll, black and metal, black and fucking melodic, black, black and thrash, melodic, fucking folk metal, black and this. It's fucking ruined the underground. Stop, everybody. Everybody, 25 years of it. Come on now, let's move on. It's even worse. Imagine Seattle for 25 years. It's like, if you're, if you're used to the underground, it's like being in fucking hell. <laughs> so stop. Black metal isn't cool. It was never cool. You know, it was interesting for a short period of time, but, you know, dead and Euronymous and the rest of them. People are saying that the uh, movie was a lie, you know, because they weren't that, you know, because they were dark and grim and brooding. But the actual documentaries were a lie. Trying to paint them in this, you know, cult, cold, cool, you know, over, you know, thinking, you know, just uh, smash society and the rest of it. And but they were just a bunch of idiots. And so the, they were lied about in a movie. They were lied about in the uh, documentaries, even worse. That painted them as cool. They weren't cool. They were, look at the Candlemas videos, you know, they, you can see dead in those messing around, you know, teenagers on a, on a, on a mission. They were almost kind of when it comes to uh, Euronymous and Co. They were more elitist than revolutionists, you know, because they ended up copying uh, Celtic Frost and the rest of it. This whole law was created by books and by the documentaries and everybody lapped that shit up as if it was true. So black metal kids, you, there's a, there's millions of you. You are the mainstream. You're mainstream as fuck. Take off the fucking corpse paint and come up with your own shit and stop reading Aesop's fable on what's cool when it comes to musicians. You know, it's, it's like, you, you remind me of those housewives that fall in love with somebody in prison because he killed somebody. You know, if only you can tame them. Jesus Christ, put it down. Put down put down the corpse paint. You're not fucking dark and brooding. All right? It's done. <laughs> Imagine that, though. 25 years of fucking grunge. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> On a side note, I have a feeling that one of my favorite uh, documentaries, a rockumentary, if you will, it's not Spinal Tap, which is amazing, but it is bad news. And I have a, I have an opinion that Vim Fuego, the bad news guitarist, on the first one, bad news, was based on Mantis. Because if you look at it, the, there's this hilarious video of the making of, I think it's Nightmare, and uh, of the video, and it is just purely, it's almost like frame for frame taken from some of the old bad news uh, documentaries. I think the second one, more bad news, was still a little bit of Mantis in there, but also a lot of Motley Crue in there as well. You know, the Shout to the Devil video and everything was the burning, looting, raping, shooting. Even down to being interviewed by the girl, you know, because they that, they kind of had a little, a little interviews here and there. And it was, 
you you can't tell the two apart. If you take one thing away from this band, Kronos was driven. He went to where the music is, studio. He pushed and pushed and pushed, didn't take no for an answer, kept on going, got free time, you know, with an engineer, kept on going, you know, uh, became the bass player, became the front man. And so push, push, push. Don't it, it, w- One thing that a lot of uh, my research has done when, it, when it's come to key advice is to go where the music is. You know, the music isn't in your project studio. That That's you, you know, rotting away. Yeah, I wasted my 20 years of my life doing it. So you need to go to whatever music hub where the bands are playing, where the bands are recording, where are the, uh, where can you mingle? Where can you get your foot in the door? Where can you make coffee for some engineer? You know, you got it. That's, that's how you, that's how you do it. And think about the pyro, you know, they would watch Kiss and people like that because they couldn't afford it. They had to make their own, right? They, they rigged it. They, they, they welded their own base, you know, big metal base and basically a pipe bomb and they filled it with black powder. Because they were in a mining area, somehow they got access to black powder. And they would fill this thing with black powder and just blow it up on stage. They brought it to America. They put it on stage. And they put, because they were in America, they put a little bit extra in. They set it off. It blew a hole in the floor. It uh, the, the actual metal fa- base went flying and got stuck into a concrete wall. The pipes below the stage ruptured and the water started flooding everywhere. Did they kid? They could have killed somebody with these things, you know. And there's that's fucking venom, dude. They they were insane. They were insane. And I gotta give them credit. The hustle, Kronos being there, going to where the music is, going to the studio, getting his foot in the door, pushing, and the bass player leaves, the singer leaves. The singer was called Jesus Christ. <laughs> the singer leaves. I'll become the singer. Let's go, go. You know, keep going. Go to America. Can't afford pyro. Let's just take our own pyro to America with us. All in the name of rock and roll. Fucking Venom. So they, if you look at the description, I have way, all lots of gear that they used in the past. I mean, Kronos used JCM 900s, uh, his acoustic amp. This is his main one that he records with now. It's a vintage amp, solid state. And thanks to Chris Holman, he cleared me in on a lot of these uh, of this information from uh, at the Facebook group. Just search Circle of Tone on Facebook. Come and join us. Uh, he was actually a roadie for Venom. And he gave me even give me a sentence on his JCM 800. So that's that's awesome. So that's what I used. What I used, if you go to my Instagram, you can see pictures of the settings and uh, the pedals I use. I actually ended up just using a vintage MXR EQ to boost mine because I tried the fuzzes. I tried the fuzz face, the blue fuzz face. I tried other types of fuzzes. And I couldn't get anywhere near their sound. But then again, like I say, it was chaos. So I think you can forgive me for that. All right, chaps, and thanks to my patrons of Tone, and thanks to the newest patron, who is Finn McKinty. I think you know him. <laughs> so that's awesome. He likes friend of the channel. And uh, Richard P. and Co., you guys are the best. Really, thank you guys for uh, helping me keep these speakers flapping. All right, chaps, you've been great. Coming up soon, I'm going to go into more detail on Kronos' gear in a future Fat Strings Friday. It's going to be a new thing that happens next year when it comes to the bass guitars. And so it's more of recording the bass specifically and what I do and gear that people use, like John Entwistle. Big Kronos influence right there. <laughs> if you know any gear that people used in the past on any type of music, uh, let me know and uh, maybe I'll recreate it one day. Have a good one. Circle it down. Ah!